it's working now. Cheers. So anyhow, um, originally, um, Noah was going to teach tonight. We we're trying to set it up where we have uh, different people within the congregation, Robin, Catherine, Noah, Anna, Timothy, uh, Jason, some of the others that have come up, Stan, and, and others to, to teach, uh, to give them opportunity to use their gifts and to, uh, to share what's on their heart with everyone. So Noah was going to teach tonight, uh, but uh, there was a communication issue. Um, I thought I had told him, and he thought I didn't. <laughs> and so I had asked him to do so, but he was waiting for a confirmation. And I generally say, will you teach? And then I just expect that is the confirmation, unless they hear differently. So anyhow, he'll be teaching upcoming. So, uh, but, so what I decided to do, because um, I shared a little about this on Shabbat, um, and somebody asked me if I could say it again or say it because they only caught part of it. And, uh, so I want to talk about something that um, is, it can be an issue in the Messianic movement. It shouldn't be an issue in the Messianic movement, but it can be an issue in the Messianic movement. And, uh, and that's the, the, uh, the question is, is there a place for the oral Torah within the Messianic movement? And when I say that, um, there's a whole lot of discussion going on right now. Um, the IMCS has put out a book called Non-Torah, which is a statement uh, about this whole issue. There's other people that are having conversation uh, about this issue. And so I wanted to say for, for our congregation where I stand on the issue so that people will understand and also those watching online may get a grasp on what this is about. So. Let me start out by saying, in order to understand what we're talking about, we first have to um, define the terms uh, that we're using. So when normally when people say the oral Torah, they're talking about um, the idea that when God spoke to Moses, along with the written Torah, there were instructions that God gave to Moses verbally that were passed down generation to generation to generation and so on. Now the truth is that almost no one believes that what I just said. It is just what people assume is meant by it and because people make assumptions based on that they then define what Orthodox Judaism and Conservative Judaism and uh, bits of Reform Judaism understand based upon the thought. So let me start out by saying almost nobody believes that when God gave the written Torah to Moses that he gave all of what is called the oral Torah to Moses also and then it was passed down generation to generation. Um, so it's important for us to start there. It's also important for us to understand that there is a difference because we use the word Torah and Torah means instructions. And there's a difference between what someone would call the oral Torah and trying to put it in the category of the five books of Moses as God's written instruction to Israel and just using the term instructions for the how we live our life uh, within the scope of Judaism. So having said all that, um, I do not believe that God gave Moses what is called the oral Torah at Mount Sinai along with the written Torah. The reason I don't believe that is verse 4 of chapter 24 in the book of Exodus says, All the words which Adonai spoke and we will do so. Moses wrote down all the words of Adonai, then rose up early in the morning and built an altar below the mountain along the twelve, with twelve pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. So the scripture tells us that everything that God told Moses, Moses wrote down. So that is our position. That is my position as the rabbi here. That is my position as to the written Torah. It was all written and everything God told Moses was written down. Now, 
Beyond that, we have to understand that there are instructions, traditions, and customs which have been handed down. Those custom traditions and and uh, uh, and instructions and, and customs and, and all are not in any way equal to the written Torah. They're not even agreed upon by different sects of Judaism. Even within the Orthodox movement, you have those that are uh, Ashkenazi and those that are Sephardic, and they have a different interpretation of many of the things that are within what is in the Talmud, in the uh, what's known as the Oral Torah. However, there is a place within Messianic Judaism for the culture, the traditions, and the instructions as long as they don't contradict the written word. And so, for instance, I wear a kippah all the time. If I'm not at my house in my bed or sitting on a chair, when I walk out the door, when I, I put a kippah on. There, there's nowhere in the scripture that you can point to and say, the scripture commanded us to wear a kippah. The closest thing is the instructions given to the priest to wear a, a mitre or a head covering whenever they're serving the Lord. Uh, talitot, the talit that we wear, the talit katan that we wear, is, uh, which is like an undershirt, is closer to what was worn in biblical days. Although in biblical days, the outer garment that the seat seat was on is actually like a poncho. And the seat seat were part of the poncho. And so the fact that we wear a talit gadol or a large talit in service or a talit katan is a cultural tradition that's been passed down that allows us to keep the commandment in a way that is not us wearing a long uh, skirt-like dress all the time in modern times. So it's an adapted and tradition that's been handed down. We light the Shabbat candles on Arab Shabbat, and we light the Havdalah candle at the end of Shabbat, which is tradition. And it's something that's handed down to assist us in keeping the Shabbat and marking the beginning and the end of Shabbat. We have a Siddur that we follow in the Siddur, and all of the Siddur that we follow comes from the oral tradition. It's all prayers that were handed down that represent the temple service. We can't make the sacrifices and offerings in the temple, we can't go to the temple, so instead of doing that to keep our hearts looking and longing for the temple, for all the things that go on at the appropriate times, we have the Siddur and we say the prayers from the Siddur as we go along. It's tradition that's passed down. Now, tradition can be good. There's a lot of really good traditions. And as long as they, they don't contradict the scriptures and as long as we don't make the traditions and the uh, cultural things equal to commandments, then we're okay. But once we start making judgments as if somebody has failed, in other words, if I wear a talit katan and somebody else wears a talit, and people want to start judging over a right and a wrong way, because one they say is more Torah than the other or more commanded or whatever, then we get into problems and we have issues. If somebody wants to light the candles according to tradition to do it uh, so many minutes before the sundown and to do it 45 minutes after sundown on Shabbat to light the Havdalah candles and all that, or if somebody just wants to do it at sundown, those are things that we can do as long as we're recognizing the Shabbat, which ultimately it's the Shabbat that's the commandment, not the lighting of candles. But if we equate the lighting of candles with the commandment, then we've begun to have issues and problems. And there's a lot of things that go along that way. And we need to be really careful in how we deal with this issue because there are those that... Um, when these traditions were codified and put together, they were put together largely with the intent of having some kind of unifying guidebook for Judaism. 
the reason we needed that was because there was no temple standing anymore. And without the temple standing anymore, they had to have a way for Jewish people to live. How do we live as Jews without having the temple? The temple was the centrality. It was the, the place where we did our sacrifices. It's where our priesthood was. It's where all those things were. So we had to have some mechanism to keep Judaism, Judaism without a temple. And so initially the oral Torah or the oral instructions or the oral traditions were written to keep Jews all over the world doing the same things. We we're scattered in many nations and that way people in Germany would basically follow the same traditions as people in the United States and so on. Now of course when it first happened there was no United States and really wasn't a Germany. But this is first century time so that was what was started. Unfortunately, as with many other things, people began to abuse the system. And instead of using it just as a unifying force to keep everybody together in kind of one heart and one accord and one mind in serving the Lord, they began to use the uh, oral Torah as a mechanism for control for, you know, if, if you're going to be right with the Lord, you're going to do it this way. Very similar to how the Catholic Church ultimately, you know, uh, only we can read the Bible, only we can interpret the Bible, we'll tell you how to do it. And if you don't do it our way, you're going to hell and there's no way out. And so it became a control mechanism. Now, that doesn't mean that... Um, <clears throat> that the oral traditions became wrong. It meant that the people became wrong. In other words, lighting Shabbat candles didn't become wrong because somebody wanted to use that tradition to um, control the people, how they were going to do it, what they were going to do with it. Uh, Pammy and I knew a pastor in town here in Pensacola who controlled everything for every one of his congregants. Uh, they couldn't go to college unless they checked with him and he approved what they were going to study. They couldn't buy a new refrigerator or a new house or a new car unless they checked with him because he was the only one that was hearing from the Lord that could be the shepherd that would keep them in line. There was a whole shepherding movement, uh, some of you remember, uh, that were very controlling to the point of telling people, you know, you're going to do the laundry for these people and you're going to do this. And they became very much servants of the community under this controlling and domineering uh, position. So when we talk about control or abuse, it's not something that's singular to uh, forms of Judaism. We've seen it in Catholicism. We've seen it in Christianity as people became controlling instead of loving and kind and unifying. And so that's where the problem comes is when we elevate the traditions to the point of equal to commandments and then we start judging people as failed before the Lord because they don't keep the traditions. Matter of fact, Yeshua, <clears throat> these people came to Yeshua and they said, uh, your disciples aren't washing their hands before they eat bread, which is a tradition. And it's not a bad tradition. Matter of fact, I hope that you wash your hands before you eat. I think it's a good thing to wash your hands before you eat. But he told them, you're, you're not washing your hand. Your disciples aren't washing their hands. They're violating the traditions. And Yeshua's answer was, and, well, who cares? He didn't say any of it. He, so what he said was, you're violating the commandments. And he said, you're violating the commandment because, and he gave the example of how, uh, and I think I shared about this on Shabbat, how there was uh, a young man who would say, I can't take care of my parents because everything that I own has been given to the Lord. And so the commandment says, honor your mother and father. And he said, you're not even, you're not keeping the commandment. And you're upset about me <coughs> and my followers not keeping tradition. Keep them where they're supposed to be. <coughs> traditions can be helpful. We have a whole lot of traditions 
uh, here at, at, at our synagogue. We have a whole lot of traditions within Judaism that are good and helpful and things that we ought to hold on to. But there are also um, abuses to that, and that's what we have to be careful of. And one of the things we most need to be careful of, as far as I'm concerned, is that we don't, as believers in Yeshua, place ourselves under the authority of non-believers in Yeshua, which is what happens when you place yourselves under that uh, the authority of the, as if the Torah is commandments. Uh, and we shouldn't do that, ever. Uh, and it's something we have to be careful about because, uh, and, and it happened recently, uh, last year we went to a church to visit at an event, and the pastor said, uh, introducing a local conservative rabbi, and said, that man is my rabbi. Now, by doing so, he was saying that man has spiritual authority over me. Well, the pastor was a believer in Yeshua. And he was saying this man who doesn't accept Yeshua, doesn't believe in Yeshua, doesn't believe he's the Messiah, doesn't believe in the redemptive work of Yeshua, doesn't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, doesn't believe in the gospel, doesn't believe in any of that, is now the authority as a rabbi over me. And we need to be careful that we don't do that. And it's problematic to give people authority that they don't hold over us. You can hold to traditions without giving people authority over you. And so we're real careful about that. There are people within our community that keep totally separate kitchens. They have milk kitchen and they have meat kitchen. And when they come to me and say, I do this, I say, wonderful. As long as you don't Say that everybody has to abide by what you do. Don't judge others for doing less. We have to do what the commandments say. And beyond what the commandments say, we have the, uh, the grace, the ability to live the traditions within the scope of that. We read from the Torah every week. You know why we read a portion from the Torah? It's tradition. It allows us to read through the entire Torah every year. We read the Hof Torah. Where do we get the Hof Torah readings from? Tradition. We read the Brit Kadashah. Where do we get that from? Tradition. So these things that we do, we, we process the Torah around. We celebrate Simchat Torah. We celebrate uh, Pesach by having a Passover Seder. The scripture tells us to do three things on Passover. We're supposed to eat matzah. We're supposed to take a day off on the first day and the last day. And we're supposed to eat bitter herbs. Or on the initial Passover, we're supposed to sacrifice a lamb. We can't do that now. But those are the things the scripture commands us. Everything else, the four cups of wine, the karosa. The matzah tash, the three pieces of matzah, all of those are traditions that have been handed down that we've incorporated into our walk and our life, and we use them as teaching tools to share, uh, especially in, in our case, the message of Messiah and all that he did to tell the story of Messiah from the scriptures, to open up people's minds to what the scriptures actually teach. So we use the tradition to teach scripture as a backup for what the scripture says. And, but we, we have to understand that these things that we do come from tradition. It's been passed down. There are things that we look in the scripture, and I've said this before. Adam and Eve knew things that are commandments. <clears throat> Noah knew clean and unclean animals. <clears throat> they knew it wasn't right to have relations with somebody who's in your family. They knew what good sacrifices and bad sacrifices were. There's a lot of things we read in the scripture that they knew long before Moses came that's been handed down. The way to kill animals the right way, you know, not shooting them and, but, you know, sacrificing them. It says you must kill an animal the proper way, but it doesn't give us instructions on how to do that. The only way we know to do that is tradition is passed down, and we hold to it because it's been passed down. 
it's just really important that we understand the difference between thus saith the Lord and what's actually in the Torah and those things that are passed down and not to confuse those two things and conflate them. Not to give authority to a tradition, especially over a commandment. For instance, <clears throat> if Rosh Hashanah falls on a Shabbat, the rabbis say, you don't blow the shofar. Because carrying the shofar is work. Blowing the shofar is work. So you don't blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah because it, if it's on a Shabbat because it's work. But God said, blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. So there's a case where keeping the tradition of the rabbis, the oral tradition, actually contradicts what the written word says. So we don't hold to that because we won't let a tradition outweigh a commandment. And that's the way it should be in all cases. For instance, growing up in synagogue, at our synagogue in New Jersey, uh, they were very uh, observant of the Shabbat. But only to the point of you. And let me explain that. The scripture says you'll, you won't work on Shabbat. Not you, not your manservant, your maidservant, your animal. Your... So what they did was they hired a Gentile, or many Gentiles, depending on what it was, so that they could do the things that they couldn't do on the Shabbat. So they had Gentiles that came and turned all the lights on and, and did the lighting the ovens in the kitchen and serving the food and doing all those things. That's a contradiction of the Scripture. The Scripture says not to work, nor anybody. Not your, the stranger among you, nobody. And so what they did, they violated the Scripture and had Gentiles do all the things they couldn't do on Shabbat. I think that's wrong. There was a uh, Sabbath day's journey. Of course, Sabbath day's journey is not in the scripture. But Yeshua at least observed it to the point of recognizing it existed. In the scripture it says it was Bethany was a Sabbath day's journey from Jerusalem. So it was a recognized distance anyhow. And so they said, you can't go more than a Sabbath day's journey on the Shabbat. So then they said, well, Sabbath day journey, where, what's that, where's that start? Well, it starts at home. Well, where's home? Home is your house. What's your house? Well, if I have a house and then my children have a house next door and my grandchildren have a house next door, only that's 12 acres. Then home doesn't start till I get past the last member of my family. So I could walk... A mile before I even started a Sabbath day journey. If you go to major cities where they have uh, large Jewish populations, they have an roof. They have uh, usually it's a uh, power line that runs all the way around the entire city, so that they can do a Sabbath day journey everywhere within that area without leaving where they are. So you could walk all the way across town and still be home. If it doesn't violate the letter of the law, it definitely violates the spirit of the law. Uh -huh. And we need to be careful that we don't do those things. There are things we should abide to as believers in Yeshua who walk according to his word and have committed our lives to uh, following what, uh, what scripture teaches. There are also things that we do because we're part of a community. We're part of the greater Jewish community. And so there's things we do. We'll celebrate uh, certain holy, like we just gathered together for Yom Hatzma'ut, and uh, that's not in the Torah, but we gather together with the community because it's a tradition of our community. We're going to eat um, cheesecake on Shavuot. There's nothing in the Torah that says thou must eat cheesecake on Shavuot, <laughs> although I think it should be. But it's not there. It's a tradition, the land of milk and honey. It's a tradition. Torah is like uh, milk. It's like honey. It's sweet too. It's, it's, it tells, helps us to keep these things. But it's really important. And the reason I'm saying all this tonight isn't just because 
Noah wasn't here, but because I feel it's important because there are those that are presenting that we need to place the rabbis in authority over us as messianics. They should be over us and <coughs> that all of the oral Torah is equal in inspiration and equal in uh, as, as God's word. And we need to make sure we understand that's not what we believe. Yeshua, it's interesting, Yeshua kept much of the oral law in his life. He debated with some of the Pharisees. I was listening to uh, a local pastor on the radio this week, and it amazes me how often they say Yeshua spoke against the Pharisees. But it doesn't really say that. It says he spoke against some Pharisees. Just like there were some Pharisees who believed in Yeshua and were still Pharisees. The word Pharisee is not synonymous with hypocrite. There are Pharisees that were hypocrites. And Yeshua spoke talking to those people. But he was not speaking to all Pharisees. And he followed much of the tradition. How do we know that? Well, he told his disciples, go find the upper room and prepare it for Passover. There are traditions he followed in doing that. He went to the temple at the hours of prayer. There's lots of things he did that were tradition. He told uh, uh, the, the, uh, the lepers, go to the priests and do what you're supposed to do, but the parts in between there he did traditions. There's a lot of things that he did that were oral tradition that he lived right along with and never complained about and never came against. The times he did come against things was when the oral tradition contradicted the Bible. And it's important for us to understand that distinction. Tradition's not bad. Bad tradition's bad. And if we place the authority of non-believers over us, that's bad. And if we say the oral tradition or oral Torah is equal in inspiration and divine nature as the written Torah, what have we just done? We've added to the word. And the scripture is very clear about what happens and what kind of judgment comes upon those who add to the word. This is important because as we grow, as God does more things, we're getting involved with the conservative synagogue. We've had some interactions with the Chabad rabbi in town. There's things going on, and people are going to interact with these things, and they're going to try to say things and do things that are going to question whether you are right in what you're doing and I want you to know that we are right that it's fine to keep the traditions as long as they don't contradict and as long as they don't become in your mind equal to the written word of God and it's so important that we understand this because all it takes is allowing a little leaven to leaven the entire thing. Once you open the door to things and start elevating things to a higher position than they ought to be, it opens the door for all things. And we begin questioning everything. And once you question whether the rabbis are supposed to have authority over us, if you, if you ever get to that point, Timothy, if we ever get to the point, where you say, a rabbi that doesn't believe in Yeshua should have authority over me. What's the end of that line? If the rabbis are correct, and there are authority, the end of that line is Yeshua is not the Messiah. Because the rabbis who are in authority say he isn't. And if they have authority, then we have to accept all that they teach. 
And so the end result of allowing the rabbis to have authority over us in that way is the more authority, the more authority, the more authority, the more authority. We move further and further and further and further away until we accept that Yeshua is not the Messiah. I say this because I know people that have done that. There have been people from our congregation that have done that, that have walked away from Messiah because they gave authority to the rabbis over their life, over what scripture said. And, and unfortunately, it's more than one that have walked away from Yeshua. And outside of our initial community, there's many more. Because they become so enamored with the rabbis. They're so wise. They're so smart. They're so knowing. They know everything. They must be right. They're the authorities. Listen. The rabbis that don't believe in Yeshua don't have authority. I also want to say this. That because they don't yet believe in Yeshua doesn't mean they don't have any relationship with God. We need to be careful not to conflate those two things. I can tell you that there are people I grew up with that went to prayer every day that would pray many of us under the table. That were sincere about their faith and sincere about God. They're just blind so far to the Messiah. So far. I believe he's being revealed. I believe more and more are being revealed. So I'm not diminishing the fact that rabbis and Orthodox Jews and conservative Jews and some Reformed Jews and others have a relationship with God. They don't have redemption in Yeshua. And because they don't have that, they can't have authority over those of us who do. That's why the scripture talks about that... that in the last days, there's going to become this revival that all Israel will be saved. It's going to happen. God's working in a miraculous way, but we have to be careful because the closer we get to the end, the more deception is going to attack. The more of this we're going to see, and the more is going to be asked, and the more pressure there's going to be for people to choose between the rabbis and the Bible. Ultimately, Now, that doesn't mean the rabbis don't believe in the Bible. They believe in the Tanakh and their form. They just have a different point of view of it. They look at it different because they're taught to look at it different. People say, well, why can they read Isaiah 53 and not see Yeshua? They read Isaiah 53 and don't see Yeshua just like Christians read Acts 10 and don't see kosher. Or Luke 4 and don't see Shabbat. It's because they're taught that way. We're taught to believe what we believe. That's what happens when we give authority to people over Scripture. It's just really important that we understand these concepts. And, and I'm not saying this because I'm afraid. I'm saying this because we need to be educated. We need to know what we're talking about. And we need to be prepared to discuss. And so when somebody says, do you believe in the oral Torah? You can say, what do you mean by that? Do you mean oral Torah as in God gave Moses the entire Talmud on the mountain in oral? And it's been passed down through Joshua and through the... 120 and to the Sanhedrin and so on? Or do you mean the oral Torah as in instructions that are given orally that translate through generations on how Jewish people and Judaism and synagogues and people live a Jewish lifestyle, a Jewish walk? You have to ask the question, what do you mean by that? And then decide where your limit is in what you're going to accept. My limit is the scripture. If the Torah teaches it, then I'm for it. 
And if something helps, like lighting the Shabbat candles, I do that. We, we light the candles at our house. Why? Because we want to know when Shabbat starts. And we want to know when Shabbat ends. It's a marker for us. It helps us to observe. It helps us to be observant. Not because we feel like if we didn't do it, we would be violating a commandment. Because there are times where we don't get home in time to light the Shabbat candles. We're at somebody else's house visiting, ministering, sharing. We're at a synagogue or somewhere doing. We get home and it's 1130 at night. We're not going to light candles and go to sleep and have the house burned down. <laughs> it's not going to do that. Pam has been through two house fires. We just don't do things like that. But I don't think God looks down at me and says, you didn't light the Shabbat candles. You know, you're going to hell. That's not what we look at. We look at it as a way to enhance our walk with Yeshua. We say the Shema. Why do we say the Shema? It's tradition. But it focuses us on who is God? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And blessed is his name, his glorious kingdom is forever and ever. Helps us focus. We say the Bahavta. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Teach these things to your children. We say it over and over so that we'll be reminded over and over that we're supposed to do that. It's tradition to do those things. There's scripture, but it's tradition that we do it. It helps us focus. It helps us direct. It helps us be unified. It's just important that we understand the difference between those two things. And we understand because as we grow, more people come in. There are going to be people that come in that have been worshiping somewhere else, that have a different opinion, a different way they've been taught, a different way. We're going to have to be able to teach them and instruct them without necessarily running them off. Now, some of them we're just going to run off. <laughs> Those that just don't want to be part of people that come in here and want to make us something different, just uh, give, there's places to worship. We'll give them the left foot of disfellowship. And send them down the road. But people with honest hearts, we want to teach them. But we can't teach them if we don't know. We can't teach them <coughs> things we don't know. So important. And I know <coughs> this isn't as exciting as Galatians or Revelation, but this is the essence of both those books. This is important for us as a community to understand <coughs> that you can observe traditions and oral teachings and oral instructions without elevating them to the point of being equal to or greater than Torah. <coughs> the Talmud says in one section, <coughs> Excuse me, that if men are having a disagreement <coughs> and they ask the Lord who's right <coughs> or what to do, and if the Lord speaks from heaven and tells them to do something else <coughs> other than what the majority <coughs> have decided, that they should do what the majority says. <coughs> That's contradicting Torah. But it's part of what is Talmud. Giving Talmud authority means you believe that Yeshua was an illegitimate child. <laughs> and that Miriam was a harlot. Because the Talmud says both those things. <coughs> we have to be careful distinguishing what is of value, what is not. <coughs> I said on Shabbat, I'm sorry. There are things that are inspired in the Talmud. But inspired doesn't mean um, divine. In other words, God can inspire us to do something. It doesn't become scripture. It doesn't become equal with scripture. I hope that every message I preach on Shabbat is inspired by God. But it doesn't become scripture. When I teach, I hope it's inspired somewhat by God. 
but it doesn't become equal with Scripture. And it's the same way with things in the Talmud, which the Talmud disagrees with itself. And, and there's discussion. It goes back and forth, and things happen. Just because it's inspired doesn't mean it's Scripture, nor does it mean it's accurate. I know it just confused everybody. Can something be inspired and wrong? Can God tell someone to say something and have what they say not be correct? If they don't say it the way God told them to say it. No, no. There's actually times in the Bible. If the entire scripture is, is inspired word of God, there are times that people say things in the Bible that are wrong. There's false prophets in the Bible that say things that are wrong. There's... People of God in the Bible that say things that are wrong. There's people in the Bible that do things that are wrong. It's all in the Bible. There's also things in the Bible that are inspired by the enemy. Judas was inspired by the enemy. By the adversary. We need to be really careful. That's why we have to know what the scripture says. We have to know what's going on and what's happening. We have to be aware of the difference between God's word and what's not God's word. Because... The honest truth is our souls depend on The children of Israel said, all that Adonai has spoken, we will do and obey. But everything that he spoke, Moses wrote down. And he rose up in the morning, built an altar along with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes. And he sent out young men of Bnei Israel who sacrificed burnt offering, fellowship offerings, a box into Adonai. Moses took the blood, half of the blood, and put it on the basins, and the other half he poured out against the altar. He took the scroll of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that Adonai has spoken, we will do and obey. He read what he wrote. They said, all that you did, say, all that he said, we will do. And that's where we should be. Everything that God said we'll do. If it didn't come from him, if it's not in the word, from Genesis through Revelation, then we need to not hold it as scripture or as authoritative over our lives. Any questions? Yes, sir. You're differentiating between divinely inspired and just inspired. Yes. Well, and there's even things that are divinely inspired that God brought about that aren't necessarily things that were the best options. Otherwise, everybody would do everything all this right way all the time. There's things that happen in the Bible that, that God told people to do that weren't, they, they were God's way and they were right and they were inspired but when we look at it we see it as, as different somebody else had their hand up yes Where's the scripture that you keep quoting about Moses uh, Exodus 24 4 through 7 is where I read yes ma'am Good question for those that may not have heard it on the video. She asked, can I explain what a Messianic believer should do concerning uh, walking in what the community standards are? If you're part of a community, you should walk in the halakha of that community. So there's unity. 
what the community does, that's what you should do. Um, it's pretty simple. As long as it doesn't contradict Scripture. I'm, I'm making the assumption that it's not contradicting Scripture. But however, for instance, <clears throat> if this community kept separate milk and meat, then here everybody would do that because that would be the decision of the community. Here our community doesn't keep separate milk and meat, so we don't here. We don't expect that. Um, so that, that would be how, you know, whatever the community that you're living as a part of. And if you're so strongly against keeping some kind of halakha or some kind of tradition of a community, then find a different community. Don't cause disunity. Any other questions? Josh. A Masonic believer, are we considered Jewish or still Goyim? If you're born Jewish, you're considered Jewish. If you're not born Jewish, you're considered a non-Jewish person or a Gentile. Rob? From Adam to Moses, is that 14 generations? I think, That's anyway. a, I think so, yes. So, the Torah before, during that time, would be considered oral Torah. Yes. Yeah, anything before it was written down, everything else was passed down person to person. But you also have to remember that up until they go into Egypt, it's all one family. You know, it's, it's not a huge thing. When they come out of Egypt, it's written down largely because there's millions of people now. They have to have some way to 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 do that. Yes, sir. Um, so in Matthew four, the devil is trying to tempt Yeshua right. using scripture. Yes. So what then does one do if even scripture can be twisted out of the context? Well, first of all, scripture can be twisted out of context and you just put it back in context which is what Yeshua did. Satan quoted scripture out of context, Yeshua then put it back in context, and that was the end of it. That's how you deal with it. Timothy. Did you have your hand up? So when it comes to this concern about the rabbis having authority, how do we explain that we put ourselves underneath their authority, for example, the calendar, when it seems as though there are certain things that they have gone against with their tradition of not saying, well, this holiday falls on a Friday or Saturday, so you can't do it. So skip it. it seems as though they are contradicting scripture, we're putting ourselves under their authority for that. Almost none of the holidays, there, there's a few minor ones that they adjust, but the main, the holy days, they're, they're, whatever day it falls on, whether it's a Shabbat or not, it falls on Shabbat, and they keep it on that. They don't adjust in general any of the, the Leviticus 23 days. There's other days that they'll adjust around. Uh, but Leviticus 23, those days are basically, they fall whatever day they fall on is when we do it. There is the question periodically about the calendar because sometimes it's half a day off or that way. Uh, but the reality is we're never all celebrating on the same day. We celebrate on the same day on the calendar, but not the same day in reality. In Australia, they're 17, 18 hours ahead of us. So they're already done celebrating by the time we start. So having a unified calendar helps us to all celebrate the same time, regardless of, of that. And if you don't see the moon, do you not celebrate? You know, there's a few years ago they had, I think it was Iceland or Greenland. One of them had a volcano that erupted yes. and you couldn't see the sky in Europe for six months. Did they just stop time? No. This way we were in unity. Any other questions? Yes, Abigail. Would it be appropriate to call the traditions which do assist us in keeping our commandment, our tools, would it be appropriate to call it a beautification of the commandments? Repeat your question. She asked if it would be appropriate to call the oral traditions the beautification of the commandment. I 
I think maybe you could say it in that way. It helps fill out the beauty of the commandment, helps us to observe and, and to be in unity as we do it. I think that's an interesting way to say it. That's how I like to explain it. And we'll take one more question. Yes, Catherine. Can you explain um, the point of having an extra day on certain holidays for the diaspora? What does that mean? The, so that we make sure we say on the right day. There are certain times where if, if we don't have two days, we'll miss the actual day. So it just covers us in the diaspora for those things. Because people on opposite ends of the world. Right, because people on opposite ends of the world in Israel is time. So everything's focused on Israel. And so if you're not in Israel, you can be, you can actually miss and celebrate the wrong day because you miss it by that day. So that's why they had the extra day. Are we in the diaspora? Yes. Okay. If you're not in Israel, so you're in the diaspora. Doesn't matter. If you're in Greece, if you're in Jordan, you're in the diaspora. So then we should or we should not keep the days that are diaspora days? I don't. But you can if you want to. But if we're in the diaspora, why wouldn't we? Because I just keep the day on the calendar. It was added because everybody didn't have calendars. Okay. You know, we didn't, if printing was expensive. All those things are, are time changes and things happen. So, and with that, I hope this was at least somewhat helpful. Thank you. Thank you.